From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, this is a Headache Soul production. Welcome to Just the Tipsters, America's favorite true crime podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Morgan. With me today is my beautiful and talented co-host, the Sultan of Salacious. <laughs> the Sultan of Salacious. Yes. The, oh, boy. <laughs> A.K.A. Joshua Bevan. Yeah, well, all right. <laughs> do do, do you we, disagree? Are we, no. Uh-huh. I keep... Yeah, am I yeah. am I rising in the right? Yeah. It started with the Duke and yeah. then the uh, Earl. Earl. No, you were Earl, oh, Earl and then the Viscount. Duke, Viscount. Yeah. Okay, so now, now you're I'm Sultan, Sultan of Salacious, right. but not yeah. sandwiches, but Salacious. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. I like it. I felt like we discussed TikTok sandwiches too much, sure. so I had to move on. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking of like I can't remember if it was Babe Ruth or who was the Sultan the, of SWAT. The Sultan, yeah, the yeah. Great Bambino. Okay, I was oh, thinking I the Great Bambi. No, not the great Bambi. I was going to say, and coming up to bat is the Sultan oh. of Salacious, except it's not a Salacious isn't a baseball term. So anyway, yet. I thought it yet. We're going to work it into the lexicon, though. So I have a lovely list of thank yous. I want to thank Tipster Mary. She's our newest subscriber on YouTube. And I uh, want to thank Tipster Sherry for all of the unicorn information. She sent me um, a four or five minute video about the history of the unicorn in all these different cultures. Huh, okay. I mean, and it's probably like, you know, myth and maybe animalistic (laughs) anomalies, you know, like some of it was like rhinoceros probably or a rhinoceros oh, top okay. type of animal. Sure. But it is amazing to me that like um, on the, is it the flag of Scotland is a unicorn? Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, apparently many more cultures through the history of, you know, human recording had unicorn discussions than I can imagine. Hmm. I All thought right. it was like a very kind of newish thing, but no, it's pretty fascinating. So thank you, Tipster Sherry. And a big, big giant thank you to Tipster Catherine, who sent a beautiful note, and she is our newest subscriber on Patreon. Hey, welcome. And she is from Australia, and she is a lovely human being. And I hadn't checked the stats for a while, but you know, I usually would just check uh, the US, the UK, Canada, and Australia, like four major English speaking. Sure. Know? And obviously the, the US has the most uh, listeners of any other country, but Australia is beating the living shit out of the UK and Canada. Hey, all right. I know. It's amazing to me. So yeah, props to Australia for for having a large number of listeners. And we are we're very grateful you know, to whoever listens from any place, but it was just such a lovely thing to get that note from Catherine, who is um, a an incredibly sweet woman to even take the time. Nice. And, you know, financial support is always welcome, but her note was actually priceless. Oh, that was, that sweet. was the best part. Yeah. Honestly, that was the best part. So if we're big in Australia, I, I need to learn another new language. Yeah. For uh-huh. our tour. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Crikey. Oh, that's so funny you said that because Mark always said that Australia would be the first place we would do a um, live show. And I was like, let's go. I'm Sir, saying world that's tour. Not, that's not happening. No. World tour live shows. Mm-mm. No. Gonna- okay. No, not happening. Mm-hmm. Neither of us like to go very far away from home. <laughs> so I understand that nobody wants to hear two weirdos discuss reviews of things. However, I think we talked about Chicago the musical Chicago, not the band Mm -hmm. after we'd stopped recording last week. Right. You mentioned it. Yeah. It was, he deserved it. Not he deserved it. He had a, he had a coming Mm -hmm. song from, from, right. From Chicago, the musical. It was, yeah, we said it in a just quick thing. And, You looked at me funny, and then I played you the song, and you said, "Why are you making me listen to the song?" Right. I, yeah. It felt it felt <laughs> like I was being waterboarded. Yeah. <laughs> it was the worst fucking four minutes of my life, and I've had some pretty bad fucking minutes, <laughs> man. <laughs> and I really not only, a fan of musicals, only, and not a fan of uh, period <laughs> pieces. None of it. Oh, not one oh, thing. I get why you would like it because a lot of women are flexible and we're putting their heads over men's, like, you know, their legs over men's heads. But sure. I was like, what the fuck? 
is this? That, and I'm a fan of musical theater. Oh, I forgot that yeah. part. Why are we even friends? I don't know. <laughs> is I it just because you're pretty? So it's just because you're pretty, isn't it? It's we're, we're both very pretty. Oh, okay, and thanks. Like attracts. We like. just stare at each yeah. other. <laughs> Let's not even talk. Let's not talk anymore. Let's just stare at each other. That'd be a good it's podcast. It's a podcast of staring. Yeah. <laughs> Who can outstare the other? <laughs> Oh, God. I do have to say also a special thank you to tipster Alicia, who uh, messaged me that she spit her coffee out when you said it's not very big. And I said, that's what she said. (laughs) And I am embarrassed and humiliated that I did that. But as long as it makes Alicia spit her coffee out, I I'm down for that. I'm I'll do anything. I'll do anything for that. Alicia, you have no idea how many that's what she says I don't say out. Oh yeah, no, he's he's the king. He's the king. I I just I don't know what made me jump in there before. Is because you said it's oh I we were talking about the caliber of a uh, bullet or oh, whatever. Right, yeah. You go, it's not that big. Uh, right. That's, that's what, what she said. Right. Yeah, I, I don't usually get that in, but I was yeah. I was given an open door and you fucking know I charged through it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Josh was the king of um, uh, that's what the, she said jokes. That, so, yeah, because I'm I'm a middle school boy. You are. Basically. I always think I'm a twelve year old boy, but yeah. you're like, mm, I think you're like eleven. <laughs> <laughs> you're a little, you're a little in, more immature than I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have I have three adolescent. Oh, that's right. You slash do. teenage boys. And you should just you should hear our dinner table. I don't. I mean, this wanna, is the, no. <laughs> Here's something that was fascinating. Uh, at one point, Joshua's middle son, Nathan, had an injury and was home from school. And we uh, were recording on a weekday and um, a rare weekday. And Joshua brought, brought Nathan, who was like very self-possessed and quiet and didn't disturb anything. But I was like, um, my house is really open and he's going to hear you do the manscaped <laughs> read. And Joshua offhandedly says, oh, no, we talk about balls all day. <laughs> all day. <laughs> I'm like, all righty. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we just change the podcast name to Ball Talk? Ball Talk. Yeah. Ball Talk with <laughs> Welcome Joshua. Welcome back and- <laughs> to Ball Talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have to change the lineup. You're the host and I'm the co-host because I'm not fucking talking about balls, buddy. Hey, let's let's start a new one. Let, a it's whole, our side project? A side <laughs> Our side hustle? Uh, so, yeah, exactly. Maybe Matt can help us uh, with the yeah, new one, too. Matt, of the host and producer of 8,500, <laughs> every podcast that isn't, you know, I don't know. He needs one more. Joe Rogan's. Yeah, he has. Yeah, he needs one more. Yeah, we, let's talk Matt into ball talk with Joshua and Melissa. <laughs> no, wait. Ball talking. No, talking balls. Talking balls. Talking balls with Joshua and Melissa. <laughs> Oh, no. I'm sort of the idea man here. I'm good at like coming up with yeah. titles and Joshua can come up with uh-huh. the content. You keep thinking, Butch. That's what uh, you're, good at. you're you're Butch, not me. Yeah. <laughs> so today's episode, Sands Balls, is being uh, sponsored by our friends at Graveline Tours. Although I bet Adam would be fine with us talking about balls. I, I hope so. Yeah, he would be. I know he would be. Yeah, he owns a couple. Okay. At least two. <laughs> Unlike Mayor Daniel Crespo, Good. he doesn't have a third blow up one <laughs> hanging around his mouth. Sorry. I'm just going to keep burying that man, digging him oh up God. and burying him again. Look, I didn't say he uh-huh. deserved it, but then I, you played that yeah. horrible piece of music for me. Anyway, today's episode's being sponsored by Graveline Tours, <laughs> having nothing to do with testicles. <laughs> If you are Graveline Tours, tell me about it. (laughs) If you find yourself in Southern California not wanting to talk about balls, you may want to take a tour that Graveline Tours offers because they are phenomenal. And Joshua and I have personal experience with them. So, so good. It was fantastic. And I really, we have to figure out a time and a date to do more because we, I can't wait. I'm like so like rabid about this. It's really, I'm a sad creature. Uh, but if you go to graveline.rip and the promo code tipster 40 gets you 40% off of any of the tours that you would like to go on. And there are, um, a goodly number. It's not just death becomes her. 
there's Manson's murderous spree. There's um, a star is torn. <laughs> I know. And I don't know if there's a name for the one specifically for the black Dahlia yet, but um, I can't, I can't wait for that one too. Yeah, cool. It, I can't even, I don't, I don't know why this struck me so hard and stuck with me, but seeing Elizabeth Short's apartment building where she shared a room with like eight other women on like army cots, just something got me with that. I don't, I can't explain it, but it, it was so fascinating. And we're, you know, just kind of parked outside the building. We didn't go in and see, you know, anything weird, but wow, it was really interesting right. to me. I guess just to think of how long ago that was and that building still standing. And quite frankly, the building was in really good shape. Oh, like yeah. It looked like it had just been repainted or yeah, something. For sure. It was, yeah, I was very fascinated. So check out graveline.rip for our friends uh, and their tours. Besides reviewing the musical Chicago, which is a tragic, um, <laughs> I have told Joshua about a couple of Netflix shows that none of you care about, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> Uh, the night agent, which two friends of mine recommended and I poo pooed them. And then it's really great. But my new favorite show is the diplomat and it stars Carrie. (laughs) I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, it stars Carrie Russell and Rufus Sewell as her husband. And then a cast of phenomenal people. Michael McKeon plays kind of a doddering, President a la Joe Biden. Okay. Um, it's really. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. It's so well done. And here's here's why. It's got intrigue and, you know, foreign spy shit. Carrie Russell's an ambassador and thinks she's heading to the Sudan because she wants to do things to really help people. Okay. Her husband, Rufus Sewell, is kind of a retired ambassador who was maybe asked to retire because of all the shit he got into kind oh, of thing. Okay. Yeah. He's he's I think he's a good man too, but he, you know. Um, might just step in a bunch of shit all the time and trot it around. Oh, shit. So right. he's kind of like her behind the scenes mentor a little bit. They have a very different way of, of doing their job, but she does go to him for, you know, advice on certain things that she wants to accomplish or do. Cool. So the reason that I love the diplomat so much is because it is, possibly the best written role for a woman cool. I've seen in a million years. Cool. And it isn't just that it's a great role for a woman. It's a great role for a person. It just so happens to be um, this woman and Carrie Russell is a revelation to me. And it's not like I didn't love Felicity mm-hmm. and she was just in cocaine bear, but <laughs> I know yes. oh my God. yeah, yes. she's, I mean, Mark loved the Americans, which I never saw. So this is a little bit like the spy thing. Okay. Um, except she, they're, they're not spies. They're ambassadors. Okay. A married couple that are ambassadors. This is the most authentic, real fucked up, perfectly imperfect, authentic thing I've ever seen. Nice. Okay. A woman who does not give two shits and barely arrives groomed, sometimes not groomed. Carrie Russell, I think, stripped away everything. Um, Her hair is stringy and straight. We know she has those beautiful curls. Um, Not a lot of makeup. Okay. Barely dressed. She likes black suit. No, no, stop it. Not like that. (laughs) Jesus Christ. The Sultan of Salacious returns. That's why you got that name. Uh Um, She has like two black suits. Okay. And doesn't, you know, want to (laughs) wear, doesn't want to wear anything else. They need to put her in dresses, you know, Mm -hmm. and she looks, you know, you put a couple of swipes of mascara on her in a dress and she looks like a queen. Um, But yeah, they made her wear... (laughs) A gray suit at one point to a big meeting in the Oval Office. Her handlers, uh, and she spills coffee on the gray suit. Oh, no. <laughs> and then she's trying to wipe it off. And she goes, it just looks like I piss myself all day long. Jeez. Yeah. So she's right. She's like, this is why I like to wear black. 
Anyway, if you have Netflix and you want something good to watch, it's and it. I beg you to hang in there. It, it had me from episode one, but it gets better and better okay. and better and more layered. And everybody's fucked up, and yet everybody is fucking wonderful. Nice. It's very authentic, very authentic, and like human. It's very human. Cool. Yeah. Okay. I mean, people make mistakes. They, you know, sometimes admit it, sometimes they don't. It's just, I really love it. So, this was brought to us by Tipster Jerry. And I'm not sure why he sent it to me, except. Perhaps he was fascinated by the dismemberment. Oh, geez. I know. And uh, Jerry works in the kind of death investigation field. Okay. That's how I'm going to voice it. So I always like to start with law enforcement. And I did. A little over a month ago, I spoke with the detective in charge of the case. His name is Sergeant Zach Stormont in the Spokane Police Department. And he is a wonderful stand-up guy. He was on vacation the first time I called him. He called me right back, like, literally the second day he got back from vacation. And you would think not high on the list would be calling back a podcast host. Sure. But he did. And we had a really nice talk. I will tell you, he said, well, you know a lot about this case, so I'm sure you know the direction we're going in. Mm. And it will be clear uh, the more I talk about Ruth Bell Waymeyer's case that you're going to know what direction I think should be run down. And I know that's what they think too. And that's what they're trying to do, which is why they're reaching out, you know, except their PIO wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't return my call. So, um, I'm sorry, PIO. Oh, uh, public information. Oh, officer. oh, okay. Just, just like one more reason of me never meeting a public information officer that I like. Oh, huh, okay. They're, they're public disinformation I mean, officers. The, so they're the gatekeeper though. They're, yes. Okay. And their whole and, job is mm-hmm, to, to yeah. not. Okay. Yeah. Of course. To release whatever news, news press releases to the media, you know, mm-hmm. decide who gets to talk. Right. So Sergeant Stormont, um, he said, everything has to go through our PIO, which I will tell you so far, she's only let him talk to a local um, newspaper and they do a wonderful job. I think it's called the, I'll find it for you in a minute because it's really well done. The Spokesman Review in Spokane. Really great journalist. And because this case began in 1984, they have followed through anytime there is something new released. And the only reason we know that Millie Doe and how she got her name is about the sweetest thing I've ever heard. Millie Doe is Ruth Bell Waymeyer, And we only know that because of our friends at Othram Labs. Oh, okay. So they identified her all these years later. Back to the PIO. So uh, wouldn't return a call. Um, Sergeant Stormit uh, introduced us via email, was very mm-hmm. open and, you know, maybe privately he sent her an email and said, don't let me talk to her, but I don't think so because oh. he was terrific. So Sergeant Stormit, you are uh, a terrific guy and I know you want information and that's what we're going to try and do. And your PIO is old fashioned and needs to understand that podcasts have a much longer, broader reach than a two and a half minute segment on a local newscast. Yeah. Yeah. I sure. don't understand why hmm. it, it's a very open-minded law enforcement agency that realizes, um, that podcasts are another tool for sure. I don't understand people that will only let, you know, law enforcement officers, uh, detectives speak only to a local newspaper and a local, um, a local news station. That's kind of, hmm. And this, all of this, you know, rhetoric is coming from a woman who is going to be taking a class called managing the media. (laughs) I know I'm a fucking hypocrite, but I weaseled my way into a class uh, that's meant only for law enforcement. It's a continuing education class. And 
I pled my case and the director of admissions and the instructor said we would welcome you into the class. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. Good and work. I'm also excited because it's in Kentucky. So I get to go visit my best friend and a group of people who are holding me together long distance, quite frankly. And uh, so heads up, Kentucky. I'll be there in June. <laughs> Oh, geez. There'll be a disturbance in the force, and uh, I'm going to spend um, part of the time in northern Kentucky, but four days I'm going to be in Louisville. The class is taking place in the University of Louisville, so I am excited to take that class, and if I'm given any sort of opportunity, if there's like a question and answer period, I'm going to say PIOs can suck a bag of donkey dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Did I say that out loud? Was oh, that no. a question? Yeah, no. <laughs> Cause, yeah. cause it didn't. <laughs> Can PIOs suck a bag of donkey dicks? <laughs> if I go up at the end, does it make it more questiony? But <laughs> the assumption is there's probably going to be a class. Full it's for PIOs. Of, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that's, yeah, okay. yeah. And I explained. I said, you know, he was like, "Why don't he?" You know, I tried to sign up because honestly, the only PIO at this point who was one time my enemy and has turned out to be a friend is the public information officer for the Boone County Sheriff's Department, Phil Rigel, and he he's does a great job. But more importantly, he was. Um, uh, wary of me several years ago and softened his uh, stance. Okay, and he's good. the one who recommended this class. And it happens quite often that cops forget I'm not a cop. True. So it, they talk to me like I'm a cop. Sometimes they'll say codes and stuff. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, oh, I forgot you're not a cop. And I'm like, sure. oh, that's like a very big honor, but I also don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Right. So Major Rigel, Major Phil Rigel said, hey, you know what? I got such great information from this class. And he looked it up for me and he sent me the link. And I was like, great. I had no clue. It was only for law enforcement. Mm, okay. No clue. <laughs> so I go to sign up and it's like, you know, uh, who's your supervising officer? I don't have one. Uh, Joshua <laughs> is my supervisor. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up calling the director of admissions and he was a doll and okay. he was fascinated by the podcast and said, um, I, I want to know more about this. And why don't you just send me an email explaining why you want to take the class and what you expect to get out of it? Cool. So I did that. And then a day later I got an email back and he said, the instructor and I will welcome you into this class. Ooh. And I'm like looking awesome. very forward to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm going to be like a mole and I'm going to be in there like, cutting off the knees of all the PIOs. No, I'm kidding. I'm not. I hope to learn something because I feel like it'll give me an idea on both sides of the microphone. Sure. Yeah. And how better to plead your case with, mm -hmm. with the other PIOs that you're going to interact with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, and I'm it's hoping amazing. it will make me a better interviewer. Interviewing is not uh, my strong suit. People are very kind when I interview law enforcement or uh, victims or victims, family members. But it's not something I'm great at. I think the gift I do have of interviewing is that pe people feel comfortable around me. I make them comfortable. Absolutely. Even people in law enforcement who typically put up a pretty big shield, they sure. usually end up dropping it. Uh, it's funny. They all, not all, most of them start off really defensive. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, I don't know how to reassure you I am not Nancy Grace and this is not going to be gotcha. <laughs> Right. There's no gotcha here. Right. We're all trying to get to the same result, sure, somebody's absolutely. case getting solved. So this sweet girl, Ruth Bell Waymeyer, okay. a short and what sounds like brutal life. Uh -oh. Her mother and father got divorced, her mother and her sister, and she moved to Spokane, Washington. Okay. Her mother dies, and then she and her sister do not stay in contact. Mm -hmm. she ends up in something called a vagabond lifestyle. I guess now they would call it like a traveler. Okay. And she is married twice and has given birth to at least one child, if not more, uh, in her 24 years before. At 24? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So this is the latest uh, article from the Spokesman Review, who did a great job all along the way, all these years, from 1984 to 2023. Emma Epperly is the uh, journalist who wrote this. 
And she said, with the help of DNA and genetic genealogy, Spokane police identified a woman found dead along the Spokane River nearly 40 years ago. 40 years ago? Wow. Yeah, 1984. 39 years. So investigators now have her name because of Othram and a village of people working on this case all these years later. Her name is Ruth Bell Waymeyer, and there is still the mystery of who killed her. So you're going to see how Sergeant Stormont said, I think you can tell the direction we're going. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to be able to tell the direction they're going to. Unfortunately, the person that they're probably focusing on is no longer alive, but there are other connections and people, I believe other people know things and I, I'm really hoping someone comes forward. So before they knew her name, they released information that she had blonde body hair, evidence of a previous birth. She had a gap between her front teeth and an underbite, two moles on her neck, a scar in her upper left arm, a scar in her knee. And I'm hoping they find something from this. There was tape left around her arm. I don't know if that means she was taped up as, you know like as a kid kind mm-hmm. of thing yeah yeah okay here's the bad part it's all bad but this is a bad part her naked body her naked torso was found along the south shore of the Spokane River by fishermen just her torso oh jeez her head hands and feet had been severed off oh, no. she had been sexually assaulted and sodomized with a blunt object oh boy It's at that time, it was believed that she had been killed within two days of the discovery, which is June of 1984. And then there's debate by different, you know, science offices about the water temperature because the water temperature was low, even in June, maybe that increased the possibility she had died like weeks before, but we know she was found in June of 1984. The type of blade that was used to dismember her couldn't be determined. It was very ragged and a mess. Mm. Yeah. There was a severed hand that was found by a dog, and it was later misplaced by the FBI when it was sent to them for testing. Jeez. Yeah. I guess they had taken fingerprints before the actual hand was lost. And they say, we've looked through an archive of NamUs and we've excluded that hand with mitochondrial DNA. I don't know if that's true or not. I really Mm. don't. If you're going to lose a hand, I don't know that I trust you. So NamUs and Nick Mick, I found out something because of Ruth's case that I had never known. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children focuses on people 25 and younger. I thought it would be like 18 and younger. I had no idea. Oh, okay. And she was 24. They didn't, they couldn't really narrow down her age. At first it was 30 to 40, and then it was 25 to 35, and it turns out she was 24. I think it's probably because it looks like she had a rough life, you know? Got it. Yeah. They described her as a vagabond. She didn't have any, you know, ties to her only living relative or the only living relative we think she had was her sister. So this amazing um, genetic genealogist, medical examiner said, you know, we've entered what we can in, you know, NCMEC and the North American Missing Persons Database and the Doe Network you know, and they're, they're, tr- they have tried everyone who heard about this case, worked on this case has tried so hard, so many different ways from Sunday. And it takes 39 years and Othram labs to at least give her her name back. Wow. Yeah. So this, uh, medical examiner in nine, uh, no, in 2007, you know, spent hours looking at databases, you know, looking on the web, trying to figure out how do other offices with success in identifying someone, how do they do it? What are their, you know, the things they use? And she said, this case, the case of Millie really um, haunts me. We know she had at least one child, you know, I mean, 
I guess people use anything you have, like they had moles on her neck, scars on her knee, anything that somebody might remember. But she makes a good point. You know, my brother's got tattoos, but could I describe them all? No. Can you tell me how tall your brother is? Uh, not right. And you have a brother, accurate, right? Accurately, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have an idea. I have an idea, right? And I can describe his tattoos, but yeah, yeah. It might. It would take. It would take a bit. Yeah, it, it's just a very interesting thing that she brought up that I hadn't yeah. thought about until Ruth's case. That the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, you know, focuses on people twenty five and younger. And like the Doe Network, I'm hoping this has changed because this was 2007. The North American Missing Persons Database and the Doe Network are not tied to law enforcement. Oh. I'm hoping this is different now. Okay. Because that was 15 years ago. And, you know, this wonderful medical medical examiner, Hedgewald, I don't know her first name, um, female medical examiner, said these databases aren't complete and they're very difficult to navigate. And this is somebody who's really smart and trying really hard, you know? Yeah. Hmm. In 1998, 14 years after Ruth went missing, a woman is walking her dog and her dog discovers a human skull with two vertebra still attached to it in a vacant lot. That spot had been used by, a lot of people in the neighborhood to dump things. It was the site of a a church that had been torn down. After the skull was found, the lot was excavated, but there are no other remains or evidence that was there. It was 14 years later. 14 years. Wow. So the original detective who had um, Millie's case, Don Geese, it's G-I-E-S-E. Yeah. Uh, He wanted to take the skull to a forensic anthropologist in Washington And his daughter, who's a fifth grader at the time, accompanied him. And they take a detour to stay overnight in a motel. And they're watching TV. And his daughter says, we have another person in the room. And I think we should name her. Let's call her Millie. Oh. No, she just wanted to give her a name. Name that I thought. Yeah. No, she didn't see things. I was just starting a ghost (laughs) story. And then, (laughs) no, no, I just think it's the sweetest thing. And then that's what they, yeah, they just described her as um, Millie Doe for the rest of the case. And I wondered where Millie came from and the origin story is more beautiful than I could imagine. Yeah, that is sweet. A detective's daughter who's in the fifth grade says every, everyone, yeah, don't cry, don't cry. Detective Geese's daughter said something like everyone deserves a name. And I think it's mm-hmm. incredibly beautiful that beautiful. they kept referring to her as Millie Doe. And I mean, yeah. I don't think there's um, a better story about how a Jane Doe gets the yeah. name than that. I think that's that's really beautiful. Yeah. So they put, you know, the information they had through so many different databases, you know, and even though the FBI lost her hand, they were able to, uh, after taking fingerprints, they were able to rule out women who'd gone missing, a woman from Australia. Uh, There was a woman from California that our friend Carl Koppelman, the most amazing sketch artist in the universe, he actually brings in my life. In my mind, he brings the dead back to life. He is an amazing artist. I think he was like an accountant and he would do this like pro bono. Wow. Like find, you know, um, cases that were open and they, it was a Jane Doe and he would draw them and I'll be goddamned if he wasn't really on the money. He got it. Wow. Yeah. So he even did some background work on Millie Doe and found a woman so similar. It wasn't her, but so similar from California. She had the same two moles on her neck. Mm. She had a space between her teeth. So similar. She was a thinner, more gaunt, and I think much more blonder hair than Ruth had. Okay. But I see why he wanted to test her. Wow. I totally see why, but you know, it, it wasn't her. So this article back from 2007 in the spokesman review said that Millie's information had been submitted to Washington state patrols, missing and identified person database. She'd been entered into the national crime information center. 
you know, there's a computerized index of all of her information at the FBI. I mean, she's in so many databases hmm. and it takes Othram Labs to give her her name back. Wow. This is sort of uh, heartbreaking that Detective Geese said back in 2007. We're fairly certain there's a missing persons report in some agency's drawer that will settle this for us. Mm. You're always going to have friends, family, or coworkers that will miss a person. Well, that never happened. Oh, God. And we'll explain kind of why. She didn't have a job, so she didn't have coworkers. She and her sister were estranged, and her mother passed away. Mm something that a detective said, which I didn't quite understand, and maybe things are different now. But in 1984, one of the only people, is how he worded it, that could have reported her missing would have been her mother. Oh, one of the only people that would have been allowed to? Mm -hmm. Like He says have to could be, have. Like the, Yeah, you have to be a family member to start know. a missing persons yeah, case. Yeah, I don't know why he would exclude her sister, but maybe they were already estranged by men. Hmm, okay. Yeah, her mom died in 1982, and she was found in 1984. So her mother obviously couldn't report her missing. Yeah. So after the dog finds the skull, uh, they match it to the torso using DNA, and it's absolutely the same person. And they now narrow her age down to 18 to 24. Okay. Where, you know, her skull was found. Um, they absolutely did more searching, but th these two vertebra uh, vertebrae attached to the skull are the only things that are, there's nothing else there. Mm. Oh yeah, here we go. Here is uh, Detective Geese's daughter says, no one deserves to not have a name. The wisdom of a fifth grader. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was three years later, I guess, after she's found that the, or after the skull is found which was 14 years after she went missing, the skull matches the torso. They used um, the combined DNA index system, CODIS. Didn't find a match but because she hadn't been arrested and committed a crime, but they did match the skull to her body. They tried in 2002 drawings and facial reconstruction. In 2007, they tried again. So there are different drawings of her and they're kind of confusing. None of them really, in my mind, sort of uh, give a really good indication of what she looked like. Mm, okay. Honestly, the only picture I've seen is from her sophomore year of high school. So maybe she looks, you know, very different at 24. Got it. But, you know, the, the pic, it was, yeah, the, the uh, artist rendering not, they weren't very good. <laughs> they were not very good at all. So there was a case that was solved using genetic genealogy in Spokane, the case of Candy Rogers. And Sergeant Zach Stormont is like, you know what? I'm going to roll the dice and send Millie's DNA to Othram. Nice. And that was the best decision he made. Way cool. And they identify her. They build this family tree that which is how they do what they do. They have, you know, scientific grade genome testing. They have developed a proprietary way of doing things. They're, as far as I know, the only lab in the country hmm. that has their way of testing, which is why they solve so many cases. Cool. Um, it's it's amazing what they do. So, Othram had narrowed Millie's identity down to two sisters, uh, one living in the Midwest, and one. Millie and Sergeant Stormont. I mean, this is a this is a uh, village who solves this case. Cool. From the original detective to the lead now to Othram Labs to the medical examiner that won't give up to the fifth grader who gives her her mm. name. I mean, it's a village. It's a goddamn village. And Sergeant Stormont, um, you know, is like, I see a sister listed on a marriage license application. So mm. he, you know, sort of confirms that it's her. Got it. You know, they, uh, Othram Lab says there's two sisters. One is living in the Midwest. Okay. And one is, we don't know where, but it turns out that's where she, it was Ruth. Got it. So yeah, they, um, 
they connect it or Sergeant Storman and Othram together, you know, they connect it and it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating that she has her name back. And I know, I know they can, I know they can figure out, they probably already know who did it, but I know they can, I know they can do this. And I, I'm hoping somebody who hears this can do this too. So here's some of the details. She attended Rogers High School, she and her sister. You know, after her mother died, the sisters went their separate ways. They lost contact. That's why she wasn't reported missing. It was described that she had a vagabond lifestyle. She spent time in Spokane and Wenatchee. I'm hoping I say that right. At the time of her death, Ruth Bell Waymeyer was married to Trampus D.L. Vaughn. Wow. Okay. He is her second husband. And he did not report her missing. Uh Uh-oh. He is the one that is deceased. He died in 2017. Ruth's first husband is alive and cooperating fully with law enforcement. They're not looking at him. They're looking at you, Trampus. I'm just going to say that out loud. I understand he's not here to defend himself. But no divorce record. I guess he felt the need not to get one. Were they together? Well, yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. So they were together yep. at the time. It wasn't- they got married in 1981. Okay. Um, they or she had had no no information from her first husband that they had a child together, but she had had a child, one or maybe more. With with Trampus? Well, okay. or someone else. Or, okay. It wasn't with her first husband. Okay. So either with him or someone, she had given birth, live birth. It wasn't that Mm -hmm. a baby, she was pregnant and, you know, no, it wasn't that. It was, she had already given birth. It's a little, it's a little suspect that he never filed a divorce Mm. record or divorce um, complaint or whatever they're called. He had been married like possibly four times and he uses different names and a lot of legal documents he uses. Um, and, and some of this information is found by our amazing intrepid friend, Suzanne, who I just, you know, said, Hey, do you think you might look into this? And she is magnificent. And she's like this and this and this and this and this, and she's spectacular. And I'm imagining Sergeant Stormont has all of this, but I'm still going to send this to him because she, I don't know. She's sort of a wizardess. Mm. She finds really interesting shit. So Trampus, uh, David Lee Vaughn, a.k.a. David Williams Trampus Vaughn, a.k.a. Fuckface McGillicuddy. Oh, no, I made that one up. Sorry. (laughs) He was born in 1945. And Ruth was born in 1960. So he's 15 years older than her. And this is a total pattern with him. Mm, He is older, you know, by more than a couple years than every person he's married, he gets married to. So he and Ruth get married in June of 1981. And she is, you know, comes up in the Spokane river in June of 1984. So like three years later, you know, I guess it didn't work out. (laughs) I guess not in the worst way possible. (laughs) So he married, I don't know if this is his first, no, this is his one, two, three. This is his third wife, Erlene Smith. He married her in November of 1971. They got divorced in October of 1979, and this was in Washington. He is originally from Iowa. Okay. Uh, He was 13 years older than Arlene when they got married. He was 36. She was 23. They ended up having four kids together. He was married to two other women, one named probably. These are records that are, you know, we can't exactly it's like marriage name arrest records Mm. pretty sure uh that he was uh married to his first wife i think her name was nora they got married in 1965 and then she was arrested for shoplifting in 1965 there is probably another wife named kathy and it seems like he finds these like disenfranchised women maybe women who are you know having a hard way to go and then Maybe he's like, you know, he hypnotizes them or mm, just okay. preys on on women that, you know, and then they end up being vagabonds or travelers and then they commit a bunch of petty crimes. Got it. Uh, maybe 
Ruth outlived her use to him. Hmm. I'm just conjecture. Sure. Conjecture. He is arrested several times, but it's really small infractions. Hmm. Like uh, drunken disorderly, speeding, driver's license violations, my favorite one, striking fixtures adjacent to a street. Striking fixtures adjacent to like he was ran he, ran his car he into ran into a into a pole, pole or mm-hmm. a, a parking. I just meter. liked the uh, the wording adjacent to a street. Mm-hmm. I okay. like the the wording of it. It's literally it's like driving violations. Okay. It's not it's not anything big, but he has this petty arrest record. Mm-hmm. It's sort of interesting to me that on the marriage license. Uh, between he and Ruth from June of 1981, he's listed as disabled Hmm. and she's listed as unemployed. Okay. So, yeah, I'm wondering how they made a life together, how they supported themselves. My guess is not in the best way possible. all this petty stuff that Mm -hmm. they only got caught a Mm -hmm. little bit for. Sure. So one news outlet reported that he had spent prison time in Iowa. Hmm. You don't spend prison time for driving violations, right? No, you just stay you, in jail. It's, it's yeah. You gotta you gotta do something a little bigger for prison. I thought so too, but why would they report why would Iowa have on their records driving violations but nothing involving but prison? No conviction that mm-hmm. led to prison. Hmm. Something yeah. that something bigger than got wiped or just Something got lost. Hmm. Yeah, like her hand. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Maybe that's it. I mean, it just it seems it seems strange to me and to Suzanne, who hmm. when she found these arrest records, it's like, these are all minor violations. Why hmm. would they yeah. report these but not a prison conviction? Hmm. Yeah. Even if it's like expunged, which I can't imagine he's such an upstanding citizen that it's yeah, expunged. Like how do you, yeah. Yeah. Because of his Boy Scout record, mm-hmm. I'm guessing. So Sergeant Stormont said, you know, when I started working on Millie's cold case in September of 2021, it was unique in that the DNA was heavily contaminated. The samples that were collected years ago were heavily degraded, and our lab in uh, Cheney, the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, it was difficult for them to get any kind of a sample. Hmm. So he reaches out to Othram Labs, and they're magical. I mean- They, they make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And Sergeant Stormont said there was the eureka moment for him when he was cross-referencing a list of people that uh, Othram had given him, and he sees a divorce certificate from the first husband. Hmm. And it's got Millie's real name. And he said it it listed her and her sister on that form. Yeah, wow. So he tracks down her sister living in the Midwest who has changed her name, and he doesn't know why, but sounds like their home life wasn't a good one. Mm -hmm. And he explained that we would like to collect your DNA to make sure that this person is Ruth. And she said, absolutely. And it, Sergeant Stormont is so empathetic. And he goes, this is something, you know, many people have been dealing with since 1984 but she hasn't known for 40 years. Oh, wow. So for her, it's like she just found out that her sister died. Wow. And Sergeant Storman said she's going through all of the stages of grief right here, right now. Yeah. That's that's very heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. So her first husband still alive, cooperating fully. No reason why Trampus D.L. Vaughn would not have filed for a divorce when he did his other wives. Sergeant Stormont says he's a mystery. He used several different names, several different times, several different records, driver's license, things like that. This I'm interested in. I'm really hoping people can shed some light on him. He died in 2017 in California, but carefully worded much better than I Sergeant Stormont says he has not been ruled out as a suspect, Mm -hmm. but there is more work to do. So if you lived in Spokane, Northern California, and Iowa, and you know anything about Trampus D.L. Vaughn, David Lee Vaughn, David Lee Williams Vaughn, any of the names he went under, 
I'm going to give you a number. And if you happen to go to Rogers High School in Spokane, classes 76 through 1980, Sergeant Stormont would love to hear from you if you knew anything about Ruth. And they're going to try to put everything together so that this case can properly be closed. So the Spokane Police Department is really hoping that anyone that knew Ruth Bell Waymire or all of the names her creepy husband had, or even their children, please contact the Spokane Police Department at their crime check number. And that's 509-456-2233. Again, the crime check number is 509-456-2233 and more cowbell. If you would like to support this podcast and get early access and other cool murderous swag, go to patreon.com slash justthetipsters. Justthetipsters.